Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Cool. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. So we will uh, shortly discuss the generation of electromagnetic waves and um, spectrum of electromagnetic waves. And after that, we will proceed with a new topic, uh, light and optics. So <clears throat> we'll consider the nature of light and also um, start to discuss laws of ray optics. Okay, let me share with you my screen. So if we um, connect two conductive wires to a uh, AC uh, power supply, some voltage generator. So that will start to move charges in this uh, system. It's so-called like dipole antenna. So why dipole? Because <clears throat> we can consider as two charges um, because of uh, different potential uh, to different sides, positive and negative potential, that will cause to rearrangement of uh, electrons in these wires. And um, if they are rearranged in during a half of period, bottom part will be negatively charged. And during another half of period, uh, the upper part will be uh, uh, negatively charged. So they kind of um, flip over uh, twice per period. So obviously, if we have charges, they create electric field. Also, we have current because these charges are moving back and forth. So moving charges, that's electric current, which generates magnetic field. All these charges and currents, they are time dependent, so they are changing over time as fast as we change um, this AC voltage applied to this dipole antenna. So we know that um, varying magnetic and electric fields, they um, create uh, electromagnetic wave. And that's the most common approach, how we generate ele electromagnetic waves uh, by creating conditions when we have um, both varying electric and magnetic field, which result eventually they support each other because we know from Maxwell equations that um, varying magnetic field later generates um, varying electric field and varying electric field generates um, varying magnetic field. So they are always um, working together and form this electromagnetic wave. And also like here, you can see the um, direction of electromagnetic waves generated by dipole antenna. Um, this uh, ellipses, they uh, show the directions of uh, electromagnetic wave propagation. So we have more um, spread of electromagnetic waves along axis X, while along axis uh, Y, which coincides with the um, orientation of these conductive um, wires, <coughs> uh, these uh, electromagnetic waves are not uh, spread. And uh, obviously, when we uh, talk about um, electromagnetic waves, we need to uh, discuss the whole spectrum of possible electromagnetic waves. And uh, uh, that's quite wide. 
range, uh, so-called, um, let's come from the shortest electromagnetic waves. These are gamma rays and X-rays. So these are very um, energetic uh, radiation with high energy, which can penetrate through different materials quite efficiently. And uh, uh, for instance, X-rays is widely used in uh, medical purposes for uh, diagnosis of different diseases and broken um, bones, also a defectometry of different materials. And uh, um, this ultraviolet, which goes in terms of wavelengths uh, from one nanometer to uh, something like 400 nanometers, this ultraviolet um, part of the spectrum, which um, represents also high energy uh, part of the spectrum, and uh, it's efficiently absorbed by um, our atmosphere, upper parts of this ozone layer. Uh, so it prevents penetration of this ultraviolet spectrum originated from our sun uh, to the surface of um, our planet. And uh, um, oh, that definitely helps a lot for uh, living organisms on the surface. Uh, because it's quite harmful for biological uh, tissue and uh, can cause uh, different damage of this tissue. Um, we still have certain part of this spectrum coming to the surface. That's why not uh, recommended to spend time under intensive uh, sunlight during summer for long without any uh, sun protective uh, covers. So next one is very narrow, which actually is a visible range. So it's magnified here. So it go from violet, which we already can see. You can see here, it's about 40, 400 nanometers to red, which is 700 nanometers. So this extremely narrow, spectral range of electromagnetic waves, which can be detected by uh, human eye. And uh, um, that's the combination of these wavelengths um, provide all this um, enormous combination of possible colors which we can detect. But you should understand that in the range of electromagnetic waves, this is really very narrow. So we probably see in very narrow spectral range. So next after this red, we have infrared. So that is um, spectral range of um, electromagnetic waves mostly emitted by uh, hot uh, bodies. So starting from, if you heat up some metal piece uh, up to 500 degrees Celsius, you will see that it starts to glow with such dark red, like faint dark red color. So uh, that is in this region when we start to see, so it's thermal radiation goes already uh, to shorter wavelengths, uh, short enough that we can detect by our eye. Um, however, at lower temperatures and most bodies are at lower temperatures than 500 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> um, they emit in this infrared uh, range, and uh, that's quite common technology for detecting um, for instance, human or some other living organisms which are uh, hotter than the environment. So our temperature of our body is 36.6 degrees Celsius. And um, it's usually uh, higher than the um, environment. Let's consider something like 20 degrees Celsius. So that creates a contrast um, in terms of irradiation of in the infrared spectrum. And um, that what can be detected 
by uh, special infrared uh, detectors designed to um, detect these wavelengths and provide so-called uh, night vision or like vision in the infrared spectrum. So sure, we have quite limited possibilities to detect this visible range with our eyes. However, by applying certain technology in terms of the de detectors of, um, in the form of detectors of infrared um, light, we can significantly extend this region where um, electromagnetic waves can be detected and uh, transformed into some, on some monitor into a visible image uh, and uh, later used for uh, inspection of uh, some thermal insulation where we get some thermal losses or uh, for some safety and security operations, which require such capabilities to um, get signals in the infrared spectral range. Then we have uh, microwaves, those which are used in, uh, like shorter, are used in the um, microwave heaters uh, to warm up our lunches and longer are uh, used in communication purposes, uh, which require quite short wavelengths in order to transmit high, uh, like large amount of information, get high pass, uh, band pass of uh, information via these frequencies. And longer, so uh, like we can call them like radio waves, so starting from TV and radio um, broadcasting uh, and uh, um, some really long range, um, very extremely long uh, electromagnetic wavelengths. So they start from something about one meter wavelengths and go to beyond one kilometer. So um, obviously need to keep in mind that uh, the longer valence, the easier it is to it is to spread over longer distances. Um, it is possible to organize um, radio connection with um, radio stations located at opposite sides of the planet. Uh, so how it works, definitely you cannot transmit directly. Um, you cannot transmit through the planet. However, taking into account that uh, upper layers of atmosphere are ionized, so it's some kind of sort of plasma. Um, These ionized upper layers of atmosphere, they act as some conductive layers which can uh, reflect elect long electromagnetic wavelengths. So if you, at certain angle, transmit electromagnetic wavelengths, it goes up, reaches upper layer of <clears throat> atmosphere, then it reflected and uh, can be transmitted further by these uh, several reflections from the ionosphere. Uh, that's why how, um, how it's possible to organize uh, radio connection like via radio waves um, between different uh, extremely far located radio uh, stations. <clears throat> so uh, with electromagnetic waves, I believe we already discussed pretty much everything what we needed and uh, um, we can start with now with uh, our discussion of light and um, optics. So first of all, we need to consider what is nature of light. And uh, um, we already discussed that light can be considered obviously in terms of um, electromagnetic waves, 
but also it can be considered in terms of um, photons, which are quants of uh, um, electromagnetic wave energy. So initially, until 19th century, um, light was considered as some flux of particles. So it was considered by starting from Newton um, as uh, so to possess some particle nature. So let me maybe stop sharing this and I will share the other slides. Uh, so until 19th century, particle theory uh, was developed and all this reflection and refraction of light was considered in the scope of this particle theory, um, developed initially by uh, Newton and supporting for long time. But starting from 1801, um, experiments by Thomas Young, have shown that light, which was previously considered as um, a flux of particles, possess certain uh, properties which are um, very similar to mechanical waves. So he conducted experiments which show the effect of interference uh, on visible light. And uh, um, that was already a quite strong proof that indeed light is electromagnetic wave, not a flux of particles. Later, Maxwell, we discussed this already, um, developed a very nice and strong model based on this system of Maxwell equations, which quantitatively described light in the scope of electromagnetic um, nature. So starting from 1801, it was considered as a wave, electromagnetic wave, not particles anymore. So that continued for about a century. And uh, later we came up with experiments and uh, some phenomena which could not be explained in the scope of this wave model of, electro of, of light. So that experiment was, <clears throat> and can be considered as also a phenomenon, is a photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect, you will definitely learn in details about this effect during modern physics course. But um, yes, in short, um, all materials consist of atoms. Atoms possess certain electrons around them, around their <clears throat> uh, nuclei. And upon illumination of the surface of some material with uh, like light of certain properties, uh, it is possible to get kicked out electrons from the surface of the material and uh, mm, then measure their kinetic energy. So this effect is called photoelectric effect. And uh, the biggest problem with this photoelectric effect that with increase of intensity, it was not observed increase of kinetic energy of these mm, electrons, which are coming out from the surface of the material. Uh, so definitely there is some binding energy which keeps electron 
inside the atom, inside the material. Um, so obviously you need to provide enough energy to get it out from the material, but um, the rest of the energy provided to the system by um, shining light on it uh, should result in the kinetic energy of these electrons, which became free from the material where they resided before. So it was shown that with increase of light intensity, the kinetic energy does not increase. We just get more electrons, but not um, the same amount of electrons with higher kinetic energy. <clears throat> so as you remember, intensity of electromagnetic wave is proportional to E squared. Means proportional to the uh, electric field in the second power. So the idea was that we increase intensity, we increase obviously quite a lot uh, intensity with increase of electromagnetic uh, with electric uh, with the magnitude of electric field. If we have higher electric field for high intensity it should pro, like exert larger force, electric force on um, electrons, which are electrically charged particles. And that larger force should perform larger work and provide eventually larger kinetic energy to these electrons, these photoelectrons, which are kicked out from the surface of the material. The problem was that there was no correlation between light intensity and kinetic energy of uh, kicked out photoelectrons. In order to explain this, Einstein proposed to introduce uh, quantums of light energy, which are photons. And then it was shown that the energy of photon, Planck's constant times frequency, nu, uh, is equal to h nu. So then it was shown that with increase of frequency of light with the same intensity, we indeed get the same amount of photoelectrons with higher kinetic energy. Um, however, when we just keep the wavelengths or the frequency the same and increase intensity, um, with kinetic energy, nothing happens. We just get more um, photoelectrons. Means that light can be represented in the form of a flux of some particles called photons, which energy is defined by their frequency. And if we go for fixed frequency, some monochromatic light, we increase intensity. This increased intensity um, means that we have higher number, like larger number of um, photons per unit time per square centimeter, for instance, per unit area. Um, if we have more of these photons, we can generate more photoelectrons. There will be more interactions between these photons and electrons. So more photoelectrons will be created and kicked out from the material, but their kinetic energy will be the same. However, if we increase frequency of the light, so we go, for instance, from green to blue, means we increase frequency of the light, uh, then we indeed can increase um, kinetic energy because this energy of photons, so these particles of light in Einstein's explanation, they um, carry more energy. Then when they transfer this energy to electron, um, eventually it will um, have higher kinetic energy as a photoelectron. So that was kind of coming back to the or original understanding of uh, light, which was proposed by Newton, that is flux of particles. So 
Um, however, we cannot say that it is true model for light because the electromagnetic model of light also explains quite a lot of um, phenomena and uh, um, which cannot be explained by, by uh, from point of view of particle uh, nature of light. So that's why nature of light is so-called dual. So it, it possesses wave and particle uh, features depends on the conditions where we observe them. We can use one or another in order to explain the um, light, like effects of light, uh, some phenomena related to electro spreading of electromagnetic waves or um, interaction of light with, uh, with different materials. So we here in the scope of uh, physics two um, start now our discussion of so-called ray optics or geometric optics. So ray optics considers the projection of uh, light along uh, straight lines. Uh, so it assumes that light travels in a fixed direction, in a straight line, um, as it passes through a uniform medium. And it changes its direction when it reaches some um, interface where two mediums meet each other and possess different optical properties, or if optical properties of the medium where this electromagnetic wave is spreading um, changes as a function of position. So if these conditions do not happen, then it is possible to uh, consider that light travels along straight line and uh, um, doesn't change its direction if uh, the medium is uniform. So let me share again my screen. So what is important to know about um, application of ray optics, the size, the linear size of uh, objects which we deal with in the, in the scope of this model should be much uh, larger than the wavelengths. So if this linear size of this gap D is much larger than <coughs> the um, wavelengths, then electromagnetic wave goes through this without any changes. It just uh, doesn't go through shaded areas, but it continues going through the, um, this uh, gap as it was going previously without any changes in its direction. However, when we have comparable um, size of uh, this gap with the wavelengths, we see that the resultant uh, front of electromagnetic wave is changing from flat to some curved. And at some point when wavelength is much larger than the gap. We can consider it as some point source of light, which um, creates in this uh, hemisphere, um, a spherical light, like wave front, and um, spherical wave front, that is a feature of point source of light. So um, in this case, this gap, is uh, considered as point source of light. However, um, in the ray optics, we definitely deal with this uh, condition when the distance of objects which um, are related to the um, path of light are much larger than the wavelengths. So what does it mean? It means that such 
applications where we have uh, mirrors, lenses, prisms, um, which are used in different optical instruments like uh, photo cameras, eyeglasses, um, telescopes. So it's quite wide range of uh, possible applications. Uh, all these uh, conditions satisfy um, the conditions for application of ray optics. <clears throat> so that's why we focus now on this ray optics. And uh, first, what we want to um, uh, discuss, uh, this is reflection of light. So when light is reflected, any suggestions? Yeah, you are welcome. The ray of reflection is equal to the ray of incidence. So that, sure, that is correct. Uh, but that tells us already uh, how this reflection happens. But it doesn't answer the question why it happens. So the reason for that comes from the definition of conditions for ray application of ray optics. We mentioned that light travels along straight line and doesn't change its direction if it travels in uniform medium. So if we don't have uniform medium, and that is the key requirement to have any reflection, um, then the direction of um, light will change. So why we don't have the same uh, like uniform medium? So we had uniform medium here. It was air or vacuum, whatever it is. So it doesn't change its optical properties as the um, light is laser is traveling through it. However, when it reaches the surface of some sample, let's say mirror, um, then optical properties here at this interface is drastically different from optical properties of this medium. And that is the condition when we have um, change of um, direction of this uh, ray, um, which is called reflection. So as you mentioned before, indeed, one of the key um, rules for reflection, first of all, the incident angle um, should be equal to the reflected. So the angle between the ray and normal to the surface, the incident ray and normal to the surface, should be equal to the angle between reflected ray and normal to the surface. Plus, we need to uh, mention that these two rays, they stay in one plane. So reflected uh, light from a flat surface, obviously, uh, does not go uh, into a different uh, plane uh, as the incident ray. So they stay in the same plane. So that is um, a so-called specular reflection. When surface is smooth, and uh, uh, that's how it's shown in the real uh, life. So we see this laser beam um, reflection. Uh, they have the same angle uh, with respect to the uh, normal to the surface and um, they stay in the same plane. However, we can consider surface as smooth only in that case if um, the surface possesses um, roughness smaller than the wavelength of light. If this roughness is larger, then we deal with so-called uh, diffusion, diffusive uh, reflectance, and that means we have this incident light to this rough surface, and we don't see a clear reflected light. It kind of diffuses in all directions, so it just becomes like a bright spot 
where this incident light hits the surface. Uh, what the reason for that is just roughness of the uh, surface. Then obviously we don't get such uh, clear evidence of uh, this uh, specular uh, reflection. So definitely need to keep in mind that the surface condition has a dramatic impact on the reflection of light. So also what is true that not only light is not only reflected, so we have uh, this number one, the incident light, number two is reflected light, but also there is some part of this light energy which penetrates into a new environment. So now we need to deal with three rays, so incident, reflected, and um, so-called refracted um, beam or ray. And first of all, all of them are in the same plane. All three rays remain in the same plane. However, in the uh, second uh, material, like let's say we have air as medium, first medium, and then we have glass. So the angle will be different between the refracted beam to the normal of the surface, then the and angle between incident ray and normal to the surface. So what does it mean and uh, what actually, what, what causes this? So that is because of different speed of light in this environment. So here you can see V1 and V2. So uh, speed of light as we remember um, is determined by uh, refractive index, which shows in how many times uh, speed of light inside uh, some material is smaller than the uh, speed of um, light in um, free space in vacuum. So if we compare air and vacuum, there is no much of a difference between refract because refractive index of air is um, something <clears throat> about very close to unity. So the speed of light in air is very close to uh, speed of light in um, vacuum. However, that's not true for other materials, in particular glass. Um, refractive index of glass is, it changes, but on average it's something 1.52. So it's, it's higher. Um, for instance, refractive index of ice is 1.31. Refractive index of diamond is 2.42. You see it's quite significantly higher than refractive index of glass. That's why it's so um, reflecting. So it's so shiny and sparkly. Um, looks very nice um, because of very high refractive index. It creates a large difference between um, refractive indexes of air and diamond. And um, that causes very nice optical um, effects in terms of ref ref reflection and refraction of light. So uh, there is some relationship between these um, angles. So we can write for uh, refracted and uh, incident angles. Let me come back to our slide that uh, sinus theta two divided by sinus theta one is equal to V two divided by V one. So that is uh, definitely related uh, how much we uh, change the angle of refracted uh, light with respect to the incident um, ray. Um, that will be determined how much of a difference is between the speed of light in this medium. So now what we need to focus here is that um, we have different um, 
speed of light in different materials. And uh, what is important to highlight that frequency of light, which goes from one material to another, doesn't change. Um, why? Because it's conservation of energy, because frequency defines energy of the um, light, which is moving in this environment. However, the wavelength of this um, light uh, is changing of this electromagnetic wave. So we can write, we know that the speed of uh, some wave, including electromagnetic wave, is the product of uh, wavelengths and frequency, F. So if F1 is equal to F2 and that is equal to F, so frequency doesn't change, and we have different values for speed of light, lambda 1 times F and V2 equals to lambda 2 times F. So then, obviously, uh, if V1 is not equal to V2, we can write that lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2. So the reason why um, speed uh, is changing, yeah, the mechanism, how, how this uh, speed of um, um, light can change in different materials. That's how uh, wavelengths is adjusted. Uh, so when we go from air to glass, um, we reduce speed of light, and that means we reduce the wavelengths. So based on these um, facts, we can write that the ratio of lambda 1, which is incident light, and this is lambda 2 refracted light, is equal to the ratio between V1 and V2. In other form, it can be represented as C divided by N1, which stands for V1. And here it's C divided by N2, which stands for V2. And eventually we get the ratio N2 divided by N1. Taking this into account, we uh, can write that lambda 1 times n1, so the product of wavelengths in the first medium to its refractive index should be equal to the wavelengths of um, refracted light times, uh, times uh, this new refractive uh, index N2, which corresponds to the material um, in which the uh, refracted, um, like in which the refracted light is traveling. So um, assuming that N1 is equal to unity, for instance, that is <laughs> a vacuum or air, uh, we can uh, write that N um, refractive index of the new material, which um, causes this reflection and refracting, uh, should be equal to lambda uh, in air divided by lambda in this new material, wavelengths of the light. Since uh, all um, materials possess refractive index larger than unity, um, then we see that lambda n should be smaller than lambda. So every time when light goes from vacuum or air in some um, other material, for instance, glass, its um, wavelength will change. However, frequency remains the same uh, because of conservation of energy. So taking this into account, we can write for refraction um, rule the following equation, n1 times sinus eta 1, so product of um, refractive index of first material uh, of medium um, times sinus of incident angle should be equal 
to refractive index of the second material or medium uh, times sinus theta two, which is theta two stands for the refractive uh, index. So that's the way how we can, um, in terms of properties of the material, uh, refractive index, um, uh, we can determine at which angle uh, the incident ray will be refracted into this uh, new material. So we um, made some general introduction of light nature and uh, ray optics, which is applicable in that case when the linear distance of objects involved um, is much larger than the wavelengths. Uh, we considered two the most important um, processes uh, which form the basement of ray optics, which is uh, reflectance and refractance of light. So when we have reflectance, um, the angle, incident angle is equal to um, reflected angle. And what is very important, it happens only in that case when we have an interface between two mediums with different optical properties. Uh, also, we need to deal with ref refracted light. Uh, all these incident reflected and refracted rays, they uh, remain in the same plane. They don't change plane. And uh, um, the angle of refracted um, light will be determined by three parameters, actually. It is um, angle at which light uh, hits the surface and also uh, refractive indexes of um, first medium and second medium. So these refractive indexes um, show us uh, how our different um, light speed in these materials is in comparison to light speed in vacuum, in free space. And uh, uh, another important message to take uh, with you is that the reduction of speed of light in some material is caused not by change in frequency, but change in wavelength. Um, frequency doesn't change because that is parameter which defines energy, like intensity of the light. And uh, um, according to conservation of energy, it should remain constant. If you have any questions, you are welcome. So we will continue uh, discussing geometric or ray optics applications in uh, some um, building images of uh, objects uh, in uh, different uh, systems, optical systems like lenses and mirrors. Um, but that will be actually based on the laws of reflection and refraction of uh, light, which we have just discussed. So thank you for attention. Then have a good evening and see you next time on Wednesday. Thank you for this lecture. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a good evening. Take care.